2013年2月15日、ロシアのチェリャビンスク上空でエフェル塔よりも重い小惑星が大気圏に突入しました。そしてその小惑星は地上3 0キロメートルの高さで爆発したんです爆発は太陽よりも明るく輝きましたがあまりにも高いところで起きたので最初の90秒間は静かでかえって状況を悪化させてしまったのです、so、you see all these videos of people look at, look at what was that they see the, the smoke trail in the sky、oh, that's amazing and then you know Just when you think nothing's going to happen, the shockwave hits and it blows out the windows. A thousand people got glass in their face, in their eyes, because they're looking through the windows. 小惑星の衝撃波で数千の建物が壊れ、1500人が怪我をしました。この事件で注目すべきは、同じ日に科学者たちが地球近くを通過する小惑星を予測していたことです。でも、彼らが間違ったわけではありませんでした。実はチェラビンスク事件の16時間後にドゥエンデという小惑星が地球から2万7千キロ以内を通過したんですこれって人工衛星の軌道よりも近い距離になります面白いのは科学者たちはドゥエンデの通過を正確に予測していたのにロシア上空で爆発した別の小惑星を見逃していたのですこういうことって実はよくあるんですよねまだまだ人類は地球に衝突する小惑星をほとんど探知できていません1988年から1メートル以上の小惑星が1200個以上も地球にぶつかってきたんですそのうち衝突直前に見つかったのはたったの5個だけですしかもそれも衝突の1日前に発見されたのです人類は科学技術を駆使して小惑星を探していますどうして私たちは危険な小惑星を探そうとしているのでしょうか大きな小惑星が地球にぶつかってほとんどの生物が絶滅する可能性はどれくらいあるのでしょうかもし事前に発見できたら私たちに何ができるんでしょうか小惑星って実は太陽系ができた時の名残なんです。45億年前、岩石と塵が集まって溶けた原子惑星ができましたその内部では、重い鉄やニッケル、イリジウムが中心に沈んで、表面は軽いシリケート鉱物が覆っていましたこれらの原子惑星の中には、私たちが知っている惑星に成長したものもありますでも、多くはお互いにぶつかって、粉々になってしまったのです太陽の周りをぐるぐる回ってさらに小さく砕かれて小惑星になりました一部は表面から出た小石サイズの岩石でできていますそれをラブルパイルつまり瓦礫の山と呼ぶんですそしてこれらの惑星の中心部から出たものはほとんどが金属でできています、so this is... Uh, this is an iron meteorite, and essentially, it's the piece of a core of a small planetary body, like a, basically a small planet that、um, formed four and a half billion years ago, differentiated, so the core material fell out. And then this thing was smashed apart by a collision with another asteroid. But it's the oldest thing you'll ever see. ほとんどの小惑星は火星と木星の間にある小惑星帯をぐるぐる回っていますでもその中には地球に近づくものもありこれを地球近傍天体と呼びますこういった小惑星は人類にとって非常に重要な研究対象なんですスティーブン・ホーキングも彼の最後の本で小惑星の衝突が地球にとって最大の脅威だと述べていますしかし、小惑星を見つけるのが難しいのには、いくつか理由があります。ほとんどの観測は、望遠鏡で行う必要がありますよね。たくさんの写真を撮って、その中で動いている点を探すんです。太陽の周りを回っているものは動いて見えますが、遠くの星や銀河は止まって見えます。小惑星はそんなに大きくないので、しっかり観察しないと見逃してしまうんです。小惑星のサイズはメートルからキロメートルまで様々で広い宇宙では目立ちにくい存在ですでも小さな小惑星でも大きな影響を与えることがあります
例えばチェリャビンスクの隕石は直径がたった20メートルだったんですさらに小惑星の表面は暗くザラザラしています光を反射するのはたった 15% 程度なんですだから小惑星をしっかり観察するには太陽の光を浴びている時がベストですこれまでに発見された地球近くの小惑星の 85% 以上が45度の上空で見つかっていますそれはちょうど太陽の反対側に位置している時なんですつまりまだ見つかっていない小惑星が地球の近くにたくさんあるかもしれませんチェラビンスクに落ちた小惑星のように太陽の方向からやってくるものは発見がとても難しいのです。これまでに100万個以上の小惑星が見つかっています。そのほとんどは小惑星帯に集まっているんです。でも特に注意が必要なのは地球の近くにある約2万4千個の小惑星です。ただこれらが地球に衝突するかどうかを判断するのは簡単ではありません。So if you just discover an object and you only have data from a few days, then you can't really tell where it's going to go because you're trying to take this little arc of motion and predict it far into the future. So what you need is observations over years and years. But even if you have perfect observations of an asteroid, there's kind of a fundamental limit to how far in the future you can predict. And that's because、uh, a couple of effects. But one is that you know, they're not just orbiting the sun with no other influence. All of the planets have gravity, and all of the planets are pulling on、uh, near Earth asteroids and can change the orbit significantly. So there is something called dynamical chaos, which basically means after a certain amount of time, you don't know where the asteroid is going to be. And in practice, what that means is we can't do any work more than 100 years in the future. So the maximum time you can predict with any accuracy at all where a body will be is about 100 years. これは非常に重要な事実です。小惑星が一つでも衝突すれば、間違いなく重大な事態になります。これはアリゾナにあるバリンジャークレーターです。隕石の衝突でできたと最初に言ったダニエル・バリンジャーさんの名前がついています。1950年代まではクレーターは火山活動でできたものだと考えられていました。でも、鉱山技術者のバリンジャーさんは、これは鉄隕石の衝突によるものだと信じていたのですそこで彼は1903年に採掘権を取得して実際に土地を掘り始めましたなんとその目的は10億ドルを得ることだったんです Yeah, so people are motivated by money, right? So they thought, hey, we can get some iron for free, basically So they started to drill in the bottom of the crater and found nothing And then they started to do other exploratory drills, and this went on for years and, and decades. They started to drill sideways. Somebody said, you know, maybe it came in from an angle, which it did, and maybe the iron is, is not under the middle, but maybe it's over there under the wall. So he was doing drilling. If you go there, you can see the drills now. He was drilling around the wall, he found nothing. So what they didn't realize is when you have an impact at high speed, it's not like you're throwing a stone. Into a brick wall, you know, and it makes a hole and sticks in there or just bounces off. It's explosive. It's like totally explosive. So the kinetic energy of the projectile comes in maybe 30 kilometers per second. The kinetic energy of the projectile is big enough to completely vaporize the projectile, it turns it into a gas. And that gas is super hot and super high pressure. And it explodes and it blows out the crater. So the projectile doesn't really exist after the impact. I mean, little pieces can survive. But this 50 meter body was basically obliterated. So were, he was looking for something that did not exist. ベリンジャーさんは27年間400メートル以上も掘り続けました。しかし、彼が探していたものは5万年前の衝突ですでに蒸発してしまったんです。50メートルの小惑星はチェラビンスクより小さいですが、TNT10 メガトンのエネルギーを出していました。広島の原爆の600倍以上のエネルギーになります。隕石の衝突は巨大な核爆弾のようなものなのです。This is the actual size of the T-Rex skull, and I thought this is such a cool thing. I gotta have it, so I bought the T-Rex. 
the dinosaurs were wiped out by a 10 kilometer sized asteroid uh, that hit about 65 million years ago. So above a critical size, which is probably a couple of kilometers, uh, an impactor delivers so much energy that it has a global effect. So essentially it launches a whole bunch of debris into suborbital trajectories. So the ejector goes around the Earth, falls back into the Earth, all over, even on the other side of the planet from where the impact occurred. And what that means is the whole sky lights up with wall-to-wall -wall meteors. So you can imagine the sky turning from, you know, a nice blue day like today into essentially um, a red hot glow, like being inside a toaster oven. So the first effect of this impact, apart from the initial blast near, near where the actual impact occurred, the first effect is the sky turns into a great source of heat and it cooks everything on the ground. So these guys were basically cooked. Cooked uh, alive. Cooked alive as they were walking around. The only animals that had a chance were the ones living in tunnels under the ground or maybe um, in the water. And they were able to, to come back and take over without having to deal with the dinosaurs as a, a major obstacle. What are our chances that Earth gets hit by a, another 10 kilometer or bigger asteroid? In your lifetime, assuming you live to be uh, 100 years old, you have a 10 kilometer impactor like the KT extinction event every 100 million years or something like that. So the probability of getting it in one year is one in 100 million. So you have one in a million chance of dying from a 10 kilometer impactor. But because we know that there are no 10 kilometer impactors um, with a path that intersects the Earth for the next 100 years, your chance of dying from that is actually zero. So work done already has reduced that down, you know, from one in a million to, to nothing. しかし、より小さい小惑星はたくさんあります。10キロの小惑星には約1000個も存在しています。1キロのものとはいえ、かなりの被害を与えるyou would wipe out the equivalent of some European country, like France or Germany, to mention two of my favorites. So you would obliterate those countries with the impact of a one or two kilometer sized body. Do we know about all the one to two kilometer bodies that could hit us? We think that we know 90 something percent, maybe 98 percent of those bodies have been identified and we have their orbits and we can make reasonable predictions for the next 10 years or something about where they'll be. And we seem to be okay at the moment. But you know, uh, what about the ones that are just a little bit less than a kilometer? What about the ones that are 800 meters? That's still pretty, pretty savage if it hits. The science is still there. For example, it has a power to destroy the big city. But it's We're missing a lot. 100 meter size projectiles, and those guys are big enough to cause substantial damage on the Earth depending on where they hit. So it could destroy a city? Yeah, it would knock down the buildings in the city, it would cause citywide fire, and um, if it hit the ground, it would uh, throw up ejecta that would come back down, rain on the ground, it would be high speed ejecta that would obliterate a 100 kilometer zone uh, around it. And this could happen tomorrow. Well, it could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we saw a big one coming, what's our best bet for, I mean, could we do anything about it? What would we do about it? Is no, there anything we can do to actively? No, there's, there's nothing we can do. I was on a committee that looked at that, okay, like 10 years ago. Like, what, could we, what could we do? One option would be to try to bomb it. It's the st standard thing. We don't know how that would work out. Even when you got it there, and even if you could explode it, uh, on the surface or in the surface, it's not clear what you would do because typically what happens is you blow up a body and the fragments move out, they expand out, but not very quickly, and then gravity pulls them back together again. So it would reform as a rubble pile 
if it was not already a rubble pile to begin with, which it probably would be because of past impacts. So blowing up a rubble pile is something that we don't really know about. Another idea is you could attach, you could be all gentle, and attach a rocket to the asteroid and just try to push it aside. Let's nudge it aside. Instead of trying to blow it up, let's just push it gently aside so that it deflects it and it doesn't hit the Earth. The trouble is, when you work out the numbers, none of the rockets that we have can push it around enough. You would have to keep the rockets attached to the surface, which we don't know how to do. Remember, it's a rotating body for centuries to have a significant effect on the motion of the asteroid. So forget bombs, forget attaching rockets. Ablating the surface, basically you boil the surface with a laser. We don't have any lasers powerful enough and probably can't make lasers powerful enough uh, to do that from the Earth. We would have to take the lasers to the object, which is even more difficult. Uh, the idea that you could wrap an asteroid in cooking foil, aluminum cooking foil is another nice one. It may be a good one, the best one, uh, but it still doesn't really work because we don't know how to do that. We don't have a way to launch enough cooking foil to wrap up an asteroid and change its radiative properties, which would itself move the asteroid around. So the truth is, to be honest, we do not have a way now to deflect a kilometer-sized asteroid at all. We that just, could destroy a country. Yeah, we just don't have a way. And so, 10 kilometers? So, uh, 10 kilometers is, is absolutely a thousand times more hopeless. <laughs> so when, when we discussed this, you know, we, we had all these grand ideas, oh, we could do this and this, and none of them worked. We came down to the most basic idea, well, maybe if we could figure out where the asteroid is going to hit, like which city is it going to explode over, we can evacuate that city. And then we looked at the history of city evacuations, and we looked at cases, you know, where, for example, you have like a week's warning where some hurricane system is going to come in and flood a city. And, and evacuation uh, just doesn't work either. And the reason is very, very simple. Like going into a city, there are not that many freeways. Uh, if you have millions of people trying to get on a freeway, the first time a car breaks down, you, you block that freeway. So instantly you have millions of people trying to get out of the target zone and, and they won't be able to because all of the roads will be instantly blocked. So again, even that, even evacuation of a city is probably the most hopeful thing that we could try to do. Even that's really, really difficult because of the large numbers of people uh, involved. What I think all reasonable people would conclude is, let's do the thing that we can do first. So let's look for them. Let's do the surveys. Let's build the telescopes. Let's put this telescope in space. That will be a major contribution to understanding the threat from the asteroids. And then, when we find a particular object that looks especially dangerous, then we can focus on it. We can focus everything we have on it. And we can begin to think seriously and with real motivation about ways to deflect it.